Welcome back. So, uh, let us continue, but before I uh, proceed with the hybrid instruments, uh, let me make a brief mention of what we were discussing before the break. I would like you to please uh, refer to the NPTEL um, material on security analysis and portfolio management, where I have, I have explained the relationship between debt and equity in a lot of detail. Basically, what happens is that uh, the amount of equity that you have in a company acts as a cushion for lenders. So, if the cushion is larger, if the cushion is fatter, that means the risk of lenders is less and as a result of it, they can, they can lend money at lower rates. But if the company incurs losses and that cushion is wiped out or that cushion is squeezed, then the amount uh, available as cushion for the lenders becomes less, the uh, lending becomes more risky in that company and as a result of which the rate of lending also increases. People are reluctant to lend money to the company and you have to pay more to attract uh, borrowings into the company. So, that is the relationship between debt and equity. Equity acts as a cushion for lenders, uh, but uh, as I mentioned more of it in that particular course on security analysis and portfolio management. The beginning of that course, uh, first few lectures are devoted to this particular aspect. Okay. Let us now move to hybrid instruments. Now, Hybrid, uh, hybrid instruments are best epitomized by the concept of preference share. So, what are preference shares? Preference share capital means in the case of a company limited by shares, I have exp already explained that concept, concept of limited liability, that part of the capital of the company which carries a preferential right to payment of dividend during the lifetime of the company. That means, it has a preferential right, it is a preemptive right uh, as far as payment of dividend is concerned. Again, I will come back to it. Carries on a winding up a preferential right to re be repaid the amount of capital paid up. So, as long as the company is running, if it is generating profits, then the preference shareholders have a preemptive right, have a preferential right in so far as the uh, dividend is concerned. And on the winding up of the company, again the preference shareholders have a preemptive right, preferential right in so far as the distribution of assets are concerned. The claims of the preference shareholders must be met before any payment is made to equity shareholders. So, debt related features of preference shares, they have usually a fixed rate of dividend. Uh, usually, preference shares enjoy a fixed rate of dividend, just like lenders who have a fixed rate of interest. But please note, here the word is dividend, there the word is interest. In the case of debt, we use the word interest. In the case of preference shares, we use the word dividend. We will come back to it, why it is so. Preemptive right to dividend in return of capital, I have already explained that. Preference shares are under normal circumstances do not have any voting right on resolutions with that are uh, uh, tabled on the shareholders meetings uh, as far as the operations of the company are concerned. However, in certain special situations, um, voting rights do are uh, voting rights are endowed on preference shareholders by the companies act 2013. If the company is in default of preference dividend for 2 years or more. This is section 47 of the 2013 Companies Act. As far as equity related features, now here lies the reason why we call the uh, return on preference shares as dividend and not as interest. Dividend is discretionary. In other words, the company has a discretion and so far as the payment of dividend is concerned even on preferential shares. What does it mean? It means that a company may have profits even and even then it may decide not to pay dividend to preference shareholders. However, if a, uh, as far as interest is concerned, as I mentioned time and again, interest is a mandatory payment, the company must pay interest irrespective of the outcome of operations of the company. So, dividend is discretionary, interest is mandatory and here preference uh, shareholders dividend is also discretionary. Dividend is an appropriation of profits just like equity dividend. It is a distribution of profits. Dividend is not a charge against the profits as I mentioned because a dividend is discretionary. So, it is not taken as a charge against the profits and uh, because dividend is not a charge against the profits, no tax shield is available on preference dividend as well. You see how, how logically one property follows from the other. Dividend is discretionary, dividend is not a charge against the profits and therefore, 
dividend uh, does not enjoy any inter, uh, tax shield even for preference dividends. Voting rights in the case of default I have already discussed. Now, uh, uh, therefore, coming back to it, what is the relationship between equity dividend and preference dividend? Now, the important thing is both the dividends equity dividend and preference dividend are discretionary, both of them are discretionary. But if equity dividend is to be declared and paid, preference dividend must be paid and declared and paid before any div equity dividend is paid. If the preference dividend is at a fixed rate, then the entire fixed rate dividend on preference shares must be completely paid before any equity dividend is paid. In other words, we can have situations where both preference and equity dividends are not paid. We can have that situation irrespective of the company being in profits and losses, but we cannot have a situation where preference dividend is not paid, but equity dividend is paid. We cannot have this situation. So, we can have situations where preference and equity dividend both are paid. We can have uh, situations where both preference and equity dividends are not paid, notwithstanding the fact that the company has no profit. We can, we can have situations where preference dividends are paid, but equity dividends are not paid, but we cannot have a situation where the preference dividends are not paid and equity dividend is paid. We cannot have that situation. That is the implication of the definition of preference shares. Then we have uh, other hybrid securities, typically convertible securities uh, and warrants as well. Convertible securities are securities, uh, they may be preference shares, they may be bonds with, uh, with a convertible right, with a sweetener uh, uh, in the form of a convertible right, which gives the holder of that security the right to convert that particular security into equity shares in the company at a price and uh, at a particular point in time uh, as specified in the uh, offer document. Warrants are similar uh, except the fact that warrant is a tradable is it in its own right uh, and the holder of the warrant uh, gets a, a, a right to subscribe to the equity shares of the company uh, uh, on, on terms contained in the offer document. Uh, please note a convertible instrument is part of part or whole of that instrument must be converted to equity shares. The word is convertible. So, part or whole of the instrument like preference shares or like bonds gets converted to equity shares may be part may be whole, but in the case of warrants it is an independent instrument and it is can be tradable, tradable as well. It can be traded in its own right and it has to be surrendered to the company together with the exercise price at which the company allots equity shares to the warrant holder on uh, on the warrant holder uh, uh, surrendering the warrant. Now, we talk about derivatives, the final segment that is derivatives. Now, derivatives are a variant of financial instruments where we have a slightly complex situation. We have an underlying asset, an asset like uh, is, let us say if we have equity shares, let us say we have these shares of RIL and then we have a contract which the contract is such in nature that the value of that contract uh, varies in relation to there is a functional relationship between the value of that contract and the price or value of the underlying instrument for example, the RIL shares. So, if you have a, a derivative on the RIL shares then the value of the derivative contract derivative is a contract in fact. So, the value of the derivative contract will change in relation to the changes in the value or price of the underlying asset. So, that is what is a derivative. There is a functional relationship between the contract and the underlying instrument which which implies or which results in which results in the value of the derivative changing in relation to changes in the value of uh, or price of the underlying asset. So, it is a, it's a two fold uh, relationship. The underlying asset as I mentioned may be shares, but it is not restricted to shares certainly. Uh, we can have stock index indices like the uh, we have futures on uh, a Nifty, uh, we have futures on S and P Sensex. We can have uh, interest rate futures as well, interest rate derivatives where the underlying instrument is uh, treasury bills. We can have uh, interest rate instruments on treasury bonds as well, uh, uh, exchange rates can be underlying instruments, interest rate commodities, real estate etcetera. So, there is a multitude of variety of derivatives, derivative contracts have been written on literally everything under this uh, under the sun. 
Now, the typical examples of these derivative contracts, we will come back to it briefly and again take it up in the uh, second segment of this course. Uh, the typical examples of the building blocks of derivatives are forwards, futures, options and swaps. So, let us let me briefly touch upon the salient features of these type of contracts. So, before I get into that, the individual selling the derivative does not need to own the underlying asset outright. Derivatives may only require a relatively small down payment in relation to the maturity payoff. Uh, this, this point is very interesting. Again, we will come back to it. Uh, this enables the, uh, the derivative holder by virtue of using the derivative to leverage his uh, uh, position in so far as his uh, uh, investment is concerned. IFRS definition of a derivative, IFRS 9 International Financial Reporting Standards IFRS. This is the formal definition of derivative, the technical definition of derivative. So, let us quickly run through it. IFRS 9 defines a derivative as a financial instrument with all three of the following characteristics. IFRS 9 defines a derivative as a financial instrument with all three of the following characteristics. Its value changes in response to the change in an underlying variable, which may be price, which may be interest rate, which may be an index of prices or rates, or which may be credit risk or the like. Okay. So, the underlying asset, there is a huge spectrum, a wide spectrum of underlying assets on which derivative contracts have been written. As I mentioned, it could be price of some commodity, price of some financial asset like stocks, bonds, it could be the interest rate, it could be exchange rates, it could be index of prices, it could be credit risk as well. We have credit default swaps, we will come back to them in a later point in this course. It requires no initial net investment or a smaller initial net investment relative to other instruments having similar risk return characteristics. I repeat, it requires no initial net investment or a smaller initial net investment relative to other instruments having similar risk return characteristics. It is settled at a future date. Now, the important thing here is that uh, in the case of a derivative, you take a position in a derivative, your upfront cash flow is very small. Uh, however, the cash flow at maturity of the derivative, which is at a future date naturally, uh, may be significantly more. So, I, I, in some sense, it magnifies the cash flow, but uh, again, um, it magnifies subject to certain conditions and therefore, derivatives are sometimes termed as contingent claims as well. The basic types of derivatives I already mentioned, we have forward contracts, we have futures contracts, we have options and we have swaps. Forward contracts, let me try to explain this with an example. Normally, uh, uh, suppose you have to buy some commodity in the market, say you have to buy a, a calculator from the market, what would you do? You would go to the market, you would select the calculator and you would pay the price and the uh, vendor would hand you over the calculator that you have selected. This is precisely uh, what we have in the normal course of events, normal sale purchase deal. This is called a spot transaction because the, the contract is settled. In other words, the payment is made and the, and the goods are received immediately with the negotiation. You negotiate the price, you identify the desired calculator, you negotiate the price, you pay the price and you receive the calculator. So, everything is literally spontaneous. Okay, and that is why it is called a spot transaction, it is also called a cash transaction. However, they, let us modify the situation a bit. You go to the market, you select a calculator, okay, you negotiate the price today and then you say, I okay, will buy this calculator from you, I promise that I will buy this calculator to, from you, uh, but I will buy it one month later when I get my stipend. Okay. Uh, uh, one month later, when I get my stipend on the first of next month, I uh, will come back to you, I will make you the payment and I will take the calculator from you. The shopkeeper or the vendor also agrees. Okay. Now, this is called a forward contract, where the negotiation is done at an earlier point in time, let us call it t equal to 0. However, the 
actual settlement of the contract that is the delivery of the underlying asset and the making of the payment is done at a later point in time which is called the maturity date of the forward contract. Let us call it T equal to capital T. These symbols would be used literally universally during this course. T equal to 0 is today, T equal to capital T represents the majority of the instrument. Okay. So, forwards are customized contract, there is another feature which is customized, I will come back to it. Forwards are customized contracts negotiated today t equal to 0, at today's agreed price, everything is agreed today. The, the quality of the calculator, the type of the calculator, the price that is to be paid, how the delivery is to be made, all the things that pertain to the un unambiguous settlement of the contract as at maturity are all agreed at t equal to 0. But the actual execution of the contract, the settlement of the contract takes place at a specified future date t equal to capital T. The settlement is also agreed, the settlement date is also agreed today. So, this is the difference between a spot transaction and a forward transaction. The first half of the spot transaction as far as the negotiation part is the same as it is for the forward. It is the execution part, it is the settlement part. In the case of the spot transaction, it is spontaneous with the negotiation in the case of the forward contract, it is at a later date, but please note that later date is also agreed upon at t equal to 0. Cash flow occurs in the future, that is what I said, the payment, the cash flow due to the payment of the price also occurs on the date of maturity of the forward contract. No cash flow now except of course, margin. Uh, uh, for example, the shopkeeper who is having that calculator, it may be a singular calculator which is not easily available and the shopkeeper may say, okay, I will keep it for you for one month, but as token of my undertaking to keep it to you for one, uh, keep it for you for one month, please uh, pay 10 percent of the uh, purchase price as a token of your commitment to come back to me after one month with your uh, stipend and taking the calculator. So, that is called margin and that may be stipulated depending on the negotiation between the two parties, the seller and the buyer of the goods. Forwards are private contracts, that is uh, that is a very fundamental property of forward contracts, that they are private contracts. You and the shopkeeper I have agreed to a certain price and other terms as so far as, so far as the delivery of the contract is, uh, delivery of the uh, uh, calculator is concerned. Now, the important thing is this is singular to you and the shopkeeper. Uh, the world at large is not involved in this particular transaction. It is a transaction between two parties, uh, isolated parties, uh, the buyer and the seller. And therefore, both of you are susceptible to default risk. The shopkeeper may say, may, may get a higher price for that calculator tomorrow and may decide to sell off that calculator without waiting for you and when you come back after one month, he will say that no, 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 I do not have the calculator, I have sold it. Or you may decide not to come, you may get the same calculator uh, at a cheaper price from a third party, from a third, uh, another second shopkeeper and uh, you may say that uh, 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 you may buy it from there and you may never turn up with your stipend to buy the calculator from the original shopkeeper. Now, this kind of default possibility is very much there in forward contracts. Now, this is called default risk and, uh, but the important part is important part is because this contract is, sing is singular to you and the shopkeeper number one and uh, the first shopkeeper, both of you have interacted amongst yourselves, both of you have seen, uh, seen in the sense both of you have acquainted yourself with the other and as a result of which both of you have had that opportunity to assess the risk profile of the other, what is the possibility of your not turning up for buying the calculator and on your part, what is the possibility of the shopkeeper selling the calculator to some other party without waiting for you. Now, that is the important part, that is the fundamental part. You get opportunity to assess the possibility of default and as a consequence there too, you as well as the shopkeeper can take adequate remedial measures. For example, as I mentioned, the shopkeeper may demand 10 percent of the price of the calculator as a as a, a margin. So, both of you have the opportunity to take remedial measures to protect yourself in the event of default by the other party. This is very important. Why it is important? We will come back to it. Now, we, why it is important is 
is explained in this slide. Contracts which are very similar, but not exactly the same as forward contracts are called futures contracts. They are very similar to forward. They are very similar to forward contracts in the sense that they also entail the delivery of the underlying asset at a future date on terms which are negotiated at t equal to 0 and at a, a, a and, and the payment of the price also is as per the forward contract. This is the basic feature of the futures contract, but there is a host of differences as well. The fundamental differences, differences as I mentioned just now forward contract is between the shopkeeper and you between the shopkeeper and you the world at large is not involved. You can negotiate with the shopkeeper, the shopkeeper can negotiate with you, the terms can be agreed upon, the risk can be assessed, precautions protection for uh, default uh, or in the event of default can be incorporated into the contract. So, everything is, bet is between the two parties is private to the two parties in the forward contract. However, the futures contract have a different feature. The futures contract are tradable. Uh, the, the forward contract because they are private to you, they are not tradable. You can assign that forward contract, you can assign your leg of the forward contract to me, but you can only do so uh, uh, with the consent of the third with your uh, uh, shopkeeper. Okay, instead of me, uh, he will come down and he will buy the calculator. So, assignment can be done, but it has to be done with the consent of the other party. In contrast, there too, in the case of futures contract, they are freely tradable. I repeat, I reiterate the word freely tradable at exchanges which are set up for the trading of such futures. For example, we have trading of uh, uh, NSE few, uh, B, uh, Nifty futures on the NSE exchange, we have the trading of um, BSE Sensex uh, futures, uh, S and P B S E Sensex futures also on the exchange on the on the N S C. Uh, we have uh, futures on a host of other products, host of other equity shares also tradable on the on the national stock exchange. So futures are tradable, forwards are not tradable. At best, they are assignable with the consent of the other party. Futures are freely tradable. You don't need the consent of the other party. Now because of this feature because of this feature that the futures contracts are freely tradable or have to be made freely tradable, tradable uh, because uh, they, they are designed to be freely tradable. We need to have two fundamental properties embedded in futures contracts. The first property is that they need to be standardized. It is only then that they will have adequate liquidity in the market. Buyers will be able to identify sellers and sellers will be able to identify buyers. You see, uh, if you have a very singular kind of exposure, for example, you need 2,352 dollars, then it is very difficult to find a counterparty with a similar kind of uh, 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 availability of 2,352 dollars uh, in, in, in an open market. So, the net result is just as we have a standardization of currency, standardization of uh, various other items like uh, trading lots of shares, uh, we need to have standardization of futures in order that we have uh, adequate uh, liquidity prevailing in the market in so far as tradability of futures is concerned. That is one part. The second part arises from what I said about risk. In the case of forward contracts, forwards are not default free. Either party to the forward can, can default on the contract. But as part there too, I also mentioned, I also mentioned that in the case of forwards, in the case of forwards, what we have is that the two parties interact among themselves and as a result of which they have an opportunity to assess the risk profile of the other, the possibility of default and to take remedial measures therefore. Now, in the case of futures, there is no this situation is not viable. Why? Because futures are freely tradable. So, if A and B are in a, a futures contract and B sells it to C, uh, B sells his leg to C, then A does not get an opportunity to interact with C. B can, can dispense with his stake without 
getting the consent of A and therefore, in order that this kind of transaction is uninhibited, it, it is freely done, uh, we need to ensure that the futures are default free. In other words, in order to facilitate, facilitate uninhibited trading in futures contracts, we need necessarily to have that the futures contract should be free from default risk and this is done by the exchange. It is done by the clearing house of the exchange which intervenes between the two legs of the futures. If A and B are in a futures, then it, it is split up into two contracts A and the clearing house and B and the clearing house. And as far as uh, the clearing house is concerned or as far as A is concerned, A is guaranteed performance of B by the clearing house and B is guaranteed performance of A by the clearing house. As a result of which, in so far as A and B are concerned, the contract becomes a default free process. The clearing house protects itself by the twin process of marking to market and margining. What are these terms? We shall come back to it a later part of this course. I repeat, you see try to understand what is happening is that the clearing house is acting as an inter, uh, uh, intervening party which is guaranteeing the performance of both the legs of the contract. So, it is that clearing house become, which becomes susceptible to the uh, default risk of either party to the futures contract. And as a result of it, the clearing house has to evolve a mechanism whereby it can protect itself in the event of detriment on due to default of A or due to default of B. It does so by introducing the twin mechanism of marking to market and margining. But what exactly marking to market and margining is, we shall come back to it. Now, forwards are private contracts, futures forwards are customized as I mentioned, forwards carry one specified delivery date, these are some features of forward contracts. Uh, forwards are settled at maturity by delivering or cash settlement, you can have either settlement by delivery or cash settlement, forwards carry some credit risk, some default risk. As far as futures are concerned, futures are exchange traded contracts, futures are standardized, futures may carry one or a range of specified delivery dates futures are settled daily by MTM. I mentioned this is the term, but I have not explained it. I will explain it in due course. Futures are usually closed out before maturity. Futures carry virtually no credit oblique default risk. As I mentioned, both the legs of the futures contracts are guaranteed by the clearing house of the exchange at which these futures contracts are traded. Now, we talk about options. Now, the important part of which it differentiates the forward futures vis a vis options is one fundamental property. In the case of forwards as well as in the case of futures contracts, what happens is that both the parties to the contract that is you as well as the shopkeeper, both of you have uh, obligations under the future under the forward contract. In other words, it is your obligation that you go to the shopkeeper whenever you receive your uh, stipend on the first of next month and uh, go to the shopkeeper for purchasing the calculator. And as it is the shopkeeper's obligation that he makes the calculator available for you for purchase as on the for delivery as on that particular date that is first of next month. Now, Similarly, in the case of futures, the position is pretty much the similar. So, uh, I will not uh, take it up. Basically, both the parties to the contract have obligations. Uh, of course, the clearing house acts as an intervener, but that does not absolve the two parties from honoring their leg of the contract. The basic thing is that both in the case of futures and forwards, both parties under, undertake obligations under the substratum of the contract. However, when we talk about options, the situation is different. Again, we have two parties to the contract, party A, party B. Party A, let us say, is the party who is the holder of the option, the party A who has bought the option, let us say, who is long in the option in technical terminology and then party B, who is the writer of the option, who is short in the option, who has sold the option. Okay. So, there are two parties, party A buys the option contract, party B sells the option contract. What is the option contract? Option means what? Option means choice, option means discretion, op option means election. So, the basic when we talk about the option contract, one of the parties, one of the parties that is which party? The party who has bought the option contract, 
the party who has bought the option contract has the discretion, has the privilege, has the prerogative to decide whether to exercise the option contract or to let the option contract lapse as on the maturity of the contract as per the terms of the option contract. Let me repeat the holder of the option, the person who has bought the option, the person who is long in the option has the discretion, has the right, has the privilege either to uh, exercise the option, whatever that option uh, uh, may entail uh, or to let the option contract lapse. But as far as party B is concerned, the party who has sold the option con contract as far as party B is concerned, it is mandatory, it is obligatory for party B it is obligatory for party B to honor his leg of the contract. For example, if it is a con it is an option to buy an asset, then it is mandatory for the uh, party B to make that asset available for purchase. Option uh, the, the party B cannot uh, of his own uh, uh, escape from the option contract. He, he has the obligation, party A has the right, party B has the obligation. They are on different pedestal and to, co uh, to compensate party B for being at a lower pedestal for being or for carrying an obligation in contradistinction to A who has a right party A gives a certain sum of money to party B which is called the premium of the uh, on buying the option or the price of the option. And so, party A gives a certain price of the option in order to buy that contract and what does that contract give you? It gives you the right the, uh, the either to exercise the contract or exercise the option under the contract or to let the option lapse. Party B on the other hand who has sold the option, who has got the premium, who has received the premium, it is mandatory for party B for to honor his leg of the contract. Of course, if A allows the option to lapse, then B goes scot free and he pockets the premium. But if A decides to exercise the option, B must honor his leg of the contract. We will continue from here. Thank you.